Hello, I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. Thank you for joining us for today's Policy Spotlight with Don O'Connell. Policy Spotlight is a series of virtual events Health Affairs hosts to feature in-depth conversations with influential health policy experts. On the show, we've had CMS Administrator Chiquita brooks lashore FDA Commissioner Robert Califf, uh, COVID-19 Response Coordinator for the White House, Ashish Jha, and others. All of these have been recorded and you can view them on our website. It's my pleasure today to have as my guest, Don O'Connell, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, otherwise known as ASPR, in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, ASPR leads the nation's public health emergency response and preparedness efforts. In 2022, it was elevated to an operating division within HHS. It has a budget of about $4 billion and works in collaboration with other federal agencies, state and local governments, hospitals, biotech firms, and other partners. We'll talk more about what ASPR does in our conversation. I'm so pleased to have with me Don O'Connell, who was sworn in as the fourth ASPR in June of 2021, previously. Uh, she was the senior counselor to the secretary for COVID response in the Department of HHS. Uh, she's worked on the Hill for former Congressman John Spratt, who has worked in the Department of Health and Human Services and uh, was the director of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. As we begin our conversation in a moment, I want to uh, remind you in our audience, if you're listening live, that uh, you can submit questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom. Those questions will come to me. I will uh, do my best to weave them into the conversation. Sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. Um, it's helpful if they are likely to be of general interest and if they're short enough that I can read them and uh, digest them in the middle of uh, engaging in a conversation. So, but I do encourage our audience to participate. We've gotten some great questions over the uh, time we've been doing this from our audience. Uh, with that, uh, welcome, Ms. O'Connell, Don. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, maybe just to start off, I'm not sure everyone who reads Health Affairs has a deep familiarity with ASPR. So if you wanna just begin with a little history of how it was created, what the mission is, and um, Everyone I asked about ASPR mentioned this elevation to a, an operating division and I'd love to really hear about what the implications of that shift are from your perspective. Well, Alan, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. You know, among my favorite things to do is to talk about the good work that ASPR has been up to. A lot of people aren't familiar with us. And so uh, an opportunity like this to be able to share our story and talk about the work that we're doing in the mission space that we occupy is really important to me. So thank you uh, for having me. Um, this is a wonderful way to spend my Wednesday afternoon. As you can imagine, we're juggling a lot of other things. And so this is a real, uh, real pleasure. But you asked where, where ASPR came from, and you mentioned I'm only the fourth ASPR, so you can tell we're pretty new. Uh, we were founded um, in the first uh, PAPA bill, the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, uh, which was passed in 2006 in the wake of the Hurricane Katrina response, um, which was viewed by many as a failed response or you know, a response that might have been a little bit too slow out of the gates. And in doing some of the postmortem on that, looking at what worked and what didn't, um, members of Congress and the Bush administration at the time, uh, we're looking at you know the public health response and what was needed, what sort of additional focus should be brought to bear when we have uh, you know some sort of uh, natural disaster or um, or other response uh, that devastates health systems and requires you know a, a major public health focus. How do we manage that? And uh, out of that uh, conversation and dialogue between the Hill and the administration, ASPR was born. And we were put in charge of um, coordinating uh, the public health uh, response, both preparedness for and response to any of these public health emergencies, uh, as well as natural disasters, whether they're uh, and uh, human made as well. So not just disasters that are natural, but anything that would impact the health system in a, in a devastating way, we're, we're put in charge of preparing for that, uh, responding to it and recovering from that. Um, so it's quite a, a big remit, uh, but we have been uh, at it now since 2006. And 
we were initially, as you mentioned, and this is a little bit of inside baseball, you know, for those that are in HHS or, you know, uh, will understand it for those that aren't, bear with me. Um, the way HHS organizes itself, it organizes itself into staff divisions that traditionally serve staffing functions on behalf of the secretary or the larger department. So you would have your legislative office, your assistant secretary for legislation, that's a staff division. You would have your finance, your assistant secretary for finance, your uh, general counsel, because those are serving these sort of functions on behalf of the larger department, giving that sort of advice to the secretary. Um, and then you have your operating division. So you have your larger na nationwide programmatic responsibilities. Those are operating divisions. So that's where CMS comes in. Uh, the, many of the people that you interviewed that you just went through that list, Alan, you know, FDA, uh, CDC, NIH, all operating divisions, they all have major responsibility across uh, very large programs on behalf of the American people. And the the reason why it was important for me, so ASPR was founded in 2006 in that PAPA bill, and we were designated a staff division. The bill itself didn't say whether we should be an operating division or a staff division, but it, um, as the secretary at the time was putting us in place, um, made us a staff division. And that was because one of our statutory roles, in addition to the preparedness response and recovering from these public health emergencies, is also we're the principal interlocutor to the secretary and principal advisor when it comes to public health response. So we're responsible for coordinating across the department and advising the secretary on how we're going to move out in any given uh, response situation. Um, and so with that role, they deemed us a staff division that were staffing the secretary. But what they didn't take into account was we had very programmatic responsibilities. Even in those early days, we had BARDA, uh, the biomedical um, Advanced Research and Development Authority, which is responsible for uh, for the advanced research and development of countermeasures, the vaccines, the therapeutics, uh, a lot of the tests that we saw in COVID, as recently as COVID, uh, BARDA plays a critical role in that work. Um, we also have the National Disaster Medical System, uh, which are teams of clinicians that go out and get deployed into these disaster and response settings to be able to provide clinical care when needed in times of emergency. So these are two very operational functions that we had even at the beginning of our foundation. But as we've grown, we've added more programmatic responsibilities. We now have the Strategic National Stockpile that joined us in 2018. And in the course of COVID, of course, our mission space has grown, as you would imagine, to respond to uh, this once in a lifetime, hopefully, uh, pandemic. And we have HCOR, which is the uh, logistics and operational responsibility that DOD married with BARDA and NIH to form Operation Warp Speed. The pieces that DOD brought in, we've now brought into ASPR as HCOR, and they're responsible for distributing the vaccines and therapeutics uh, to the country. And then we have an industrial base management and supply chain office. And we've been investing, you know, we all saw what happened early in the pandemic when people didn't have what they needed. And most of what we did need was manufactured somewhere else. So we were uh, given a construction authority and also given funding in the various COVID supplementals to begin investing in onshoring domestic manufacturing of critical PPE and other medical supplies. Another very programmatic function. So now the tip, you know, we're, we're sort of, if you look across the work that we do, so much more of it is the, these large programmatic responsibilities. So I went to the secretary and I asked if we could uh, be considered an operating division. And the advantage to that is we would get to build our human capital and our acquisitions capability in a way that fit us. We would be independent of the department systems and be allowed to build them in a way that met our mission. And of course, being responsible for emergencies, we need to ramp things up very, very quickly. And at the beginning of COVID, we did not have everything we need. We needed in order to do that. And we relied on DOD. We relied on FEMA uh, in order to help us get going. And so what I'm looking to do now is build out this capability uh, so we can move out on our own as quickly as we need to. And becoming an operating division is one of the first steps in that process. So that's really helpful for me. So you, you have this coordinating function that hasn't gone away, but in order to uh, fill the elements of it, uh, the, you, you have to have some operating capabilities and you always have, and now those are recognized in your status. That makes a lot of sense to me. Now, maybe you've already answered this question, but I always like to ask uh, my guests, the first question is sort of what are your priorities? You've already gone through a series of things that are in your uh, purview, but uh, it, it almost seems overwhelming. So when I when I think, how do you, what have you selected as the areas that are really top priorities? 
Well, you know, I think you're right. I mean, ruthless prioritization is necessary when we're overwhelmed by a number of things that we could be focusing on and are. But for me, when I look across what we, who we were at the beginning of the pandemic prior to me being in this role, and then who we've become as we're emerging from this acute phase of the response, um, it's important that we grow and that we account for the new capabilities that we built. And it's so interesting to me. ASPR was built with uh, supplemental dollars from its start, you know, reacting to acute need that came up. And then people forget about us and, you know, and, and and we don't move those dollars to our annual budget. We continue just to live from supplemental to supplemental to supplemental, which is really not a functional way for us to grow the foundation of an organization that the country is relying on to the extent that we are being relied on now. So one of my biggest priorities when I think about take a step back and look at who we were and where we need to be so we can be stronger and provide the excellence the American people expect of us. Um, I need to be able to, to keep these capabilities so that we don't build them and then they go away and build them and then they go away and build them and then they go away with whatever you know exciting thing is happening out there in the world, but that we actually are funded to do our work day in and day out so we can be prepared moving forward at the minute um, an incident happens. So priority number one is trying to maintain the capabilities that we always needed, but we're finally able to build because of the COVID supplemental, but we'll need to move to our annual appropriations in order to maintain. And I've been, uh, it had several opportunities, of course, to uh, to testify before Congress recently, and have talked a lot about how important that is. And one of those capabilities is the supply chain work uh, that I mentioned, you know, these investments in domestic manufacturing, those are multi-year investments. Everybody understands that you can't just plop money down on a construction site and go away and expect that it'll be generating gloves, you know, in six months, you have to nurture those investments. So we need the continued authority and funding to be able to to do that. The other thing that's important to me is that I build, you know, not only the and maintain these capabilities that we've always needed and now we have, and I'd like to be able to use them against future incidents, but that I also build a foundation that's strong for ASPR. You know, it's one thing to ask to become an operating division. It's another thing to fully transition into that in a way that supports our teams, in a way that supports our programs, in a way that makes sure the American people get what they need moving forward. And so we've laid out a very uh, prescriptive approach over the next couple of years to build out this human capital so we can surge up and surge down as quickly as we need to. We can build out an acquisitions workforce so we can do this contracting in order to get prototype vaccines and therapeutics, those things we needed so quickly early in the pandemic that we can do that as quickly as we need to moving forward. So I'm continuing to focus on the foundation of ASPR, not just to ask for the, you know, the splashy next step things, but to actually make sure that if I receive those, which I've been uh, pleased to, that I can build it out in a way that, you know, it, the country deserves, that our teams deserve, so they can be supported moving forward. That's a very uh, institutional approach to priorities, building a, 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 yeah. a foundation that will last. One of those priorities is Project Next Gen uh, that must be taking a good share of your time and energy. I wonder if you could just say a little bit about what that is and what you're trying to accomplish with it. Absolutely. So I'm super excited about Project Next Gen. It's one of those things we've been focused on, focusing on for a while, but we haven't had the identified funds to be able to do that. And as we uh, saw the piggy bank getting really low last year and began to signal to Congress that we were running out of the COVID supplementals and very important pots, um, you know, we kept asking for uh, additional funds to be able to start the next generation of vaccines and therapeutics. Everyone, I think, reflects on Operation Warp Speed and how successful it was. And it was successful because we were able to put the full force of the U.S. government against the effort, um, and, and including significant amount amount of funding to bring in our you know private sector partners to get them to commit to doing this work together with us, and that was hugely successful. And we did it faster than we've ever done um, any sort of vaccine development uh, from start to finish. So to build on that, it, you know, is so important, but does require that same level of effort. And we began to signal that we would need that. Uh, last year, and we we were not able, I think, as everybody is aware, to get additional funding from Congress. So, realizing that time was ticking, and that this virus is anything if not unpredictable, and we continue to see it mutate in the variants and subvariants, and it could potentially be one mutation, two mutations away uh, from knocking out the um, 
the, the effectiveness of these vaccines and therapeutics, these tools that we've relied on and been so grateful for, and that have served the country well and you know protected so many people, but that we could lose these if the virus continues to mutate away from where we are, um, that we needed to get started quickly and, and, and make sure that we were staying ahead of the virus uh, with better vaccines and better, better therapeutics for whatever might come next. Uh, so we looked across the various pots of remaining money, we're able to combine some against this $5 billion effort, which is really important. And it's a partnership between NIH and BARDA. These were the original research organizations involved in Operation Warp Speed. We now have H4, which is our in-house uh, logistics and operations component. Um, and we're continuing to, uh, to look across the landscape. Uh, what BARDA does so well in the advanced research and development space is they look for available candidates, candidates that biotech companies and private uh, sector industry partners are, are already working on because people are working on it, seeing what's going to be viable, what would be the next new technology that we need to pull forward for a monoclonal that doesn't get knocked out by whatever the next day's variant is, or a vaccine that might not require cold chain or could be uh, it could have a longer durability. You know, what are those candidates and how do we pull those through? So BARD is looking at that now and we'll um, invest their portion of the $5 billion, um, to those candidates to try to bring them through the pipeline. And then, of course, we do this with our terrific NIH partners who do a lot of, you know, the early research on some of these candidates and can guide us to where we should be looking, what pockets of technology we should be investigating in the private sector partners. And they're going to run some clinical trials jointly across many various um, products to see what works best against where, which will allow us to spend this $5 billion very well. But we are looking for, you know, the next generation of vaccines and therapeutics to keep us, uh, you know, one or two steps ahead of this virus. So I do think when people look back at the uh, pandemic response, Operation Word Speed tends to stand out as something people say that went well, but uh, you're much closer to it. And uh, my question to you would be, what lessons do you take from Operation Work Speed, both the successes, but were there also things that we can do better next time? After all, uh, we should always be trying to improve, even if we think that the overall judgment on the effort is positive. Well, I think that's absolutely right. And I agree. Operation Warp Speed has been one of the successes. And even up close from my vantage point, it, it is a success. And there weren't a ton of failures. But a couple of things that Operation Warp Speed had going for it, that Project Next Gen isn't, you know, isn't positioned in the same way. You know, we had so much funding, thank goodness, because it was so early in the pandemic that we could look against a real portfolio of candidates. We had six vaccines that we invested in. And my understanding, someone mentioned this to me recently, is that all all six somewhere have been licensed for use. That's in some part of the world. So all of the vaccines that we invested in um, were successful in some way. Um, but we, of course, have relied on the workhorses of, uh, of the, the, um, the mRNA platformed ones, the Pfizer and Moderna's. Um, and that's been really important uh, for us to have. So, but we had those options. You know, we had multiple shots on goal. With a $5 billion investment of, across both vaccines and therapeutics, we're not going to be able to do as much. Um, and so one of the successes that Operation Warp Speed brought to us was, was the ability to get a wide portfolio and to be able to be so successful uh, with some of those investments. Um, the other thing that was a, a terrific partnership with DOD, I mentioned that we've moved their logistics and operations capabilities into HHS. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity to exercise that moving forward to see and to ensure that HHS can stand on its own. But I will say it was terrific to be able to work so closely with DOD to learn from them they're experts at the, you know, in moving things. General Perna was a wonderful partner for us. And we've been, you know, delighted to be able to take those learnings and bring them into the department so we can do the same moving forward. Um, the, uh, I would say one of the things coming out of it that's been harder to, to wrestle with is just the expectations that were set. You know, the level of success was great. And we did have multiple shots on goal that were successful and we were able to move things quickly. And we did learn so much about how to do this in 11 months uh, that now there's a, a national security strategy calling for 100 days to be able to generate the next vaccine against a novel um, virus. And so that's going to be really challenging. I mean, we appreciate stretch goals and we, you know, need to keep moving the, the needle. In fact, from the um, bivalent uh, vaccine, so the new updated vaccine that we have in COVID, from the time that FDA identified which variants they wanted the vaccine to focus on to the first shots in arms, it was only about 60 to 62 days. 
So with a head start like that, we were able to really shorten the amount of time. But what I'm afraid of, Alan, is that the expectations are high and people are expecting 11 months is now too long. You know, how do you get to that 60 days? How do you get to that 100 days? Um, and we'll just continue to work against that, you know, advance this technology as quickly as we can, you know, in this collaborative way and, and move out against the challenges. And unfortunately, it looks like we'll have lots of opportunity, whether it's with COVID or any of the other uh, pathogens that we're seeing out there uh, to exercise this skill moving forward. I'm starting to get some audience questions. I'll build them in in a moment, uh, but I want them. To, I want those who are listening to know that I am open to those. Uh, but I want to uh, cover a few topics before we get to them. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really struck by you explaining at the outset that the origins of Asper came out of Katrina, and now, of course, we're looking at the response to COVID. Um, we have a bad habit in our governance and in our approach to public health of preparing for the last problem um, more than preparing for the next one. And um, I just wonder how you think about making sure, I, I appreciate the infrastructure comments you made earlier, but how do you make sure that in all the work we're doing now, you're not just thinking of the most recent crisis we faced and figure out how could we respond better to it as opposed to thinking, boy, there's a whole array of possible emergencies uh, and crises that could occur, and we need to be prepared equally for all of them, not just uh, uh, focused too heavily on the most recent one. And that's something that I think about a lot because I agree with you, you know, memories are short and reactions tend to just focus on what was right before us. And you can be looking backwards and not seeing what's in front of you. And we do have to uh, to be very aware of that. So we're an all hazards organization. And while you know a significant amount of time and energy was focused on this pandemic response as it should be, this was an all of government, all of society response. I have teams that are deploying to hurricanes each uh, each hurricane season, which is actually about to start. Um, and and have continued to to respond there. We've had teams providing medical support on the border when needed. We continue to look at all manner of hazards, and of course they're increasing. You know what we're seeing with climate change an increase in these disasters. FEMA calls it the you know the poly crisis situation that we're currently in, where you know they're, they're the fires and then they're the floods and then um, you know they're the storms. And so we're engaged on all fronts. And one of the things that BARDA has been doing, which I think has been really useful and we're moving this into other parts of our organization, is they say they used to be one one bug, one drug. You know, they would have a countermeasure against one thing. Well, now they're looking at threat agnostic countermeasures. How do you treat the, the symptoms? How do you treat what you need, the, the reactions, the effects of any given threat, no matter what that threat is? And we're looking at that across all of our response elements. How are we sure that I, that we have the levers that we can pull, whether it's a hurricane, a flood, a fire, a pandemic, an infectious disease, a small outbreak, a large outbreak. Do I have the right places to go? And if I don't, can I get there? That's what I challenge myself every day. If I don't have exactly what I need for whatever's come forward, how do I get there? And one of the lessons we learned in the coronavirus work is that because um, because we had done MERS and SARS, because BARDA and the other um, you know, pr product developers had been doing works work on coronavirus already, we were able to pivot so quickly that research and technology to the vaccines and therapeutics that we were able to use and get to within those 11 months. Do we have that work happening, not only in the pandemic space, but in other spaces? Are we prepared to have foundational work done so we can quickly pivot to whatever the particular issue is? I think about that a lot, and I challenge the team to think about that a lot, and I'm grateful that I've got a team that's thinking in those terms because it usually is never what you just hit. It's usually the thing that comes in your side door that you're faced with next. I want to ask a number of questions sort of about relationships because you have, so you've mentioned the operational side, but you also have this coordinating and leadership role. Uh, one obvious interaction is with the White House. Uh, my understanding is there's a new emergency preparedness office uh, forming in the White House. And of course, we have the shutting down of the leadership on around COVID with the end of the public health emergency. Um, so what does it mean to be responsible for responsible? for response, forgive the poor <laughs> choice of words, uh, in HHS relative to in the White House? 
So this has always been the case. You know, I was a, a member of the Obama administration in the role of deputy chief of staff and did a lot of our response and preparedness work from the secretary's office in conjunction with Asper and others um, back then. And uh, true then and true now, the president will always want to have some sort of um, entity within the White House watching something of significance, you know, no matter what it is. And in the response space, it can be, you know, a, a, any number or level in which he would like to engage. And of course, the president should organize his White House however he chooses to. In previous times and, and across even my experience back at HHS and this administration, we've worked with NSC on some things. We've worked with DPC on other things. We work with the COVID response team. So it will be no problem for us. In fact, we welcome the partnership to work with the new pandemic preparedness office. And we you know, expect that the president will want to organize his White House in a particular way. And we will plug in and be good um, participants, leaders where we need to be, role players where we need to be. Uh, but we always expect to, uh, you know, to work closely with the White House to make sure that we're pulling the oar in the same direction. Uh, let me go in two different directions from coordination. Uh, let's talk a little bit globally. Obviously, the uh, concerns we are facing and that you're looking out into the future are ones that are, uh, many of them are global. So what is your relationship with uh, global partners? And again, how much of that comes from ASPR or do, is that expected to come from other uh, agencies within HHS or from directly from the White House? So there are a couple of different places where we play globally, though we are primarily in, you know, by statute, a domestically focused organization, which I which is the right place for us to be, given all the responsibility that we have. But we've learned and come to really appreciate the fact that we are more protected here if others around the globe are more prepared. If we can stop an outbreak where it starts rather than have, you know, everything's a plane ride away nowadays, if we can stop an outbreak where it starts, we're going to be better protected here in the United States. So we're highly invested in seeing successful global responses to any number of, and preparedness to any number of potential threats. So that is an important interest of ours. Um, we are the focal point for the WHO. So when there is a, a, a disease or some sort of outbreak identified in the United States, it's us, it's ASPR, it's our Secretary's Operations Center that conveys that news and information to WHO. So that's one of the places where we play directly with WHO. And then we support others, uh, you know, CDC has in-country offices. So if there's a you know, an outbreak happening in a place where they have an office, we will uh, be able to share our countermeasures or whatever we need to be able to end the outbreak where it started to the extent that CDC is engaged. You know, we would support CDC in that role. And we have an Office of Global Affairs that advises the secretary on those things. And of course, we would plug in where we need to as well. Uh, but, you know, I mentioned the countermeasures. So one of the places that we have, the, the biggest place where we can have an impact is our ability to provide vaccines and therapeutics to outbreaks that are happening in other parts of the world in order to shut those down and prevent them from coming to the United States. I had an opportunity recently to travel uh, to the uh, Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then down to South Africa to see some of our work to strengthen those relationships, to make sure the lines of communication were open um, whenever they were seeing outbreaks. And we had a chance when we were in Brazzaville to meet with the WHO head of AFRO, the African region, and learn about the work that they're doing. We also, through our supply chain work and our strategic national stockpile have been doing trainings on preparedness um, you know for other countries that are interested and uh, several of them have been in you know on the African continent so it was good for us to plug in and hear how people are thinking they're you know contemplating setting up hubs to be able to move uh, equipment around during a, a response you know our strategic national stockpile has a lot of uh, experience there and is able to provide some technical assistance and and in consultation as needed as requested from these other partners. So we we remain very committed to seeing other countries get prepared um, because again that helps leave the um, you know the United States uh, more protected. So let me go the other direction. Uh, our response requires a significant cooperation with state and local officials as well. Uh, what uh, sort of infrastructure do you have to work with uh, those levels of government within the U.S.? So important for us. Um, you know, most outbreaks, including something that became so national and global with COVID, start somewhere. And, you know, they usually start regionally, locally. And so understanding what our strengths are, 
what our ca capabilities are in a local and state setting is important to us. So we have um, a couple of things. We've got regional emergency coordinators. So we've got 10 regionals, regional offices within, um, within HHS. And I have regional coordinators in each of them who are working with the emergency components in the state and local governments to make sure that no one's exchanging business cards at the time of an emergency, but they all know each other ahead of time. They know what we can bring. They know what we don't have. They know how we can get it. And we understand how we work together. And so that's really important. In fact, I made a commitment in my first year to make it to all 10 regions. And I did. It was really, you know, I can sit here in Washington, D.C. and hope for the best, or I can actually get out to the regions, talk to the folks there, understand what their needs are, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and help build the capability where they're going to need it. So I found it extraordinarily useful to get down to that level um, of, of locality and really understand what the needs are. But we can always do better. So let me be clear. I mean, I think one of the things that was really hard at the beginning of the pandemic was the strategic national stockpile and states were unsure what was in it and how to access it. We hear that loud and clear and have been building an SNS transformation plan. And uh, the strategic national stockpile director has been hosting regional meetings with state and local governments, hearing their feedback, understanding what they need, also doing tribal consults to make sure that um, those governments are able to access the strategic national stockpile. They know what's in it. They know how to get it. And for states that are interested in stockpiling on their own, you know, there was a lot of interest when we didn't have what we thought we should in the strategic national stockpile. States began wondering if they needed to have the stockpiles themselves. Some have moved a little bit away from that because it's a hard job to rotate through, to understand what sort of inventory you need to maintain the inventory over many uh, over many years. But we continue to provide technical support to those states that want to do that. I mean, it's important to us that the states and localities have what they need and know where to find us. So this has been a focus and it's something uh, certainly in the stockpile that we, we know we can improve on and are continuing to do that, um, but like to keep the lines of communication open. I meet with our uh, state health officials as regularly as I'm invited to their meetings. Uh, sometimes it's weekly during MPOX and other times, you know, it's monthly or quarterly, but um, keeping that line of communication open is really important to us. Well, that uh, answers one of the questions we've gotten from the audience. Let me bring another one in from someone in the audience. Uh, and I'm going to broaden out the question a bit. They asked about uh, whether the full approval of Paxlovid will affect the distribution of the drug. And I guess I, I would have a more general question, which is, does the difference between an emergency use authorization and full approval matter to you? Or is that something that I, that that is sort of irrelevant as you're thinking about your uh, role in response? At this point, the most important, I think, transition point for us is when it moves to the commercial market and when Pfizer begins distributing it to the within the regular health channels, whether it's EUA or you know fully licensed, which we anticipate. You know, I don't want to get ahead of FDA, but um, I don't have any reason to believe that's going to be a problem. But again, I, you know, not in those conversations, that's for our regulators, um, but wouldn't anticipate that that would change um, the availability or the distribution of Paxlovid. From our perspective, we will get out of the business when we move it to the commercial market. And that's the big thing that we've been planning towards. No timeline, you know, no, no date certain yet, um, but we are watching very closely what are available, you know, how much Paxlovid we've purchased, where it can be used, um, how much is needed. You know, we bought a little bit more anticipating a winter surge that never really materialized. And we don't want the American people to pay twice. If we've purchased it for them with their taxpayer dollars, we want to make what we've purchased available to them for free as we've been promising. But at some point, we know that we're going to be out of this business. And we've been planning for what that's going to look like when Pfizer takes over. Uh, so, but going beyond just Paxlovid here, I mean, we have learned that the just because something's out in the private market doesn't mean there are sufficient supplies available in case of an increase in need. So do you really completely leave the, the field when something's out in, public, in, in the private market or, or are you saying this specifically just with respect to Paxlovid given the well, demand? This is one of the considerations we have across each of the, um, the countermeasures that we've made available for free and procured on behalf of the American people. You know, we weren't designed, nor is it, has there been an expectation that we would continue to do that ad infinitum, you know, for future generations of vaccines and therapies. Um, and we know that we, we've not been funded to do that or programmed to do that. So we've been thinking about, and I think the country expects things to move back to normal. This is one of those things that would move back to normal. But accessibility and access have been really important to, the, to us in doing this and running the program the way we have, making sure that anyone who needs it can get it. 
And, um, and we're continuing to work as we think about what commercialization will look like, what it will mean to move these to the commercial market. You know, this is an important part of the conversations that we're having. Will they have enough manufactured available for nationwide accessibility? You know, that's, you know, Alan, what you were saying. How, do, how are we sure that the manufacturers are ready to go and provide for the nationwide market? That's one of the questions and things that we're working through with them. The other thing is, how can we be sure that those that, you know, have received these for free and might not be able to afford them, otherwise might not have, you know, the insurance coverage that they need in order to continue to get it at a discount or or for free, how will they have access? And the, the administration has been committed to setting up a bridge program, making sure that some of the doses that we have procured and, you know, will continue to have that we make available through um, through HRSA's FQ, federally qualified health centers and that folks um, can get them there. Uh, CDC is working to do this through the pharmacy network to make sure that the pharmacies continue to be a place where folks without insurance can access some of these. Um, and then, of course, the manufacturers themselves have been looking at their um, uh, provider programs uh, to be able to, to ensure accessibility. So we aren't going to completely leave. I mean, I think it's important. We've done so much so far that we're not just going to walk away, but it will be important that we get the steps back into the, the, the traditional way that the health system has been functioning. We've been talking a lot about things, uh, devices, drugs, uh, supplies, when I think about emergency response, there's this whole other side, and we've seen it come out so much, of course, in COVID, but it's not new, having to do with trust and communication and uh, the intangibles that actually have a huge effect on whether all those things get to the people who need them and are used by them appropriately. Where does that part of preparedness fit in ASPR? So we, you know, understand completely the challenges that have been faced. And we have not been a principal interlocutor to the American people when it comes to the health. You know, CDC uh, has been leading that. And of course, we support them there. Um, but we do a lot when it comes to communicating about the product, you know, so we do, we are the things people, you know, when it comes to our programs, we are making sure that people have the tools they need to respond. And so important that we're communicating very carefully, as we mentioned with our state and local partners, so they know what these things are and how to use them and how to get them. So that's an important piece of communication. Another important piece of communication is making sure the American people know what we have and what we can make available. So not just our state and locals, but everybody. There are free vaccines, there are free uh, therapeutics. There are tests that people can order uh, from the U.S. Postal Service uh, through you know covidtest.gov. How are we communicating those things? We think a lot about that. Um, and, in, in, you know, among some of my closest partners in the work that I do are FEMA. How does FEMA manage communications in time of emergencies? And I'll never forget this. In a conversation I had, um, they sort of listed five things that they focus on. And, and I have heard that and tried to incorporate this moving forward. And the five things are, what do I know? What do I not know? What am I doing? What should the state, locals, or American people be doing? And they should know that all of this could change. You know, if we stick to those five things, this is what I know, this is what I don't know. Or we, the U.S. government, this is what we know, this is what we don't know. This is what we as a U.S. government are going to be doing. This is what we hope you will do. And please bear with us because this is, a, you know, this is a, a constantly moving target and we will adjust as we need to. I think if we stick with those five tenets, that's it's just a useful framework for us moving forward on how we communicate. It sets expectations properly. And I've been trying to do that in the work that I'm doing, though, again, I, not the principal communicator when it comes to the health guidances, you know, CDC and the White House have taken that role. Uh, every conversation I have with someone uh, in this administration, particularly in HHS, uh, notes that equity is a priority of the administration, it's the priority of the secretary. Um, when you think about that priority, how does that fit within ASPR? It's so important. And it has been one of the things from the beginning of this administration that we that they've made sure all of us have focused on. I give the president a lot of credit for raising this up and making sure that it's front and center in all the work that we do. I recently released a five-year plan, a strategic plan for ASPR looking ahead. And in that, it make it very clear that we are not prepared as a country until we have accounted for all of the special populations that need additional um, you know, 
additional care in this space. You know, we, we have an advisory committee that gives us advice on disasters in children, disasters in seniors, um, disasters in those with disabilities. How are we accounting for those spe special populations and our preparedness um, work? To be sure that we aren't, you know, just the lucky aren't prepared, but that others who, you know, might need additional uh, resources are prepared as well. And making sure that we are um, accounting for that will make us all prepared and that we are not prepared until that's done. So I've tried to make it very clear uh, that it, all populations are important to us. All communities, no matter at risk, ha harder to reach, are uh, focuses of, of how we think about the work that we need to do in order to prepare the country for whatever comes next. And so when we've been doing the response work in COVID, it's been a critical function of the um, vaccines, therapies, and test distribution pieces that we've done to make sure that everyone lives within five miles of a pharmacy that's able to, or a source, not all pharmacies, but a, a source of a free vaccine uh, that folks can order, you know, the test through covidtest.gov. And if you can't order because you don't have a computer, there's a phone number you can call to order your tests. And if for some reason um, you have trouble reading the test, there's a, a, a test for those that might you know, be visually impaired that we make available. How are we accounting for everybody so all Americans can have access to these things continues just to be a concern of ours and one of the places where we've been um, challenging ourselves to be sure that we're thinking of all possible um, communities that need our support. You know, another aspect of uh, stockpiling, uh, we, we, we think again about things and all the goodies that need to be in the closet available at any given time. A huge amount of the strain in emergencies is on the workforce, on the people who have to deliver the care. Um, so again, when, when you're focused on all of the elements that you are, where does, the, where does workforce preparedness and workforce reserve, which are two related, but I think somewhat different concepts. Where do those fit in your planning? So we have a program um, called the Healthcare Preparedness Program, um, HPP, and it's the only source of federal dollars for um, hospital and health system preparedness. And so that's one of the best ways that we can access the teams that are going to be on the front lines and make sure that they are thinking about these things and have the training, the connectivity, the support that they need um, and for whatever responses they're going to need to be on the front lines for. So that's one of the uh, the most impactful places that we're able to impact, um, you know, CDC is looking at the larger public health workforce and what they need in their labs and their state public health departments. And we're looking at, you know, the same within the hospital systems um, and the provider networks, the coalitions to make sure that they have the support that they need. And we do this through this these funding grants to, to be sure that, um, that they have the federal funding to be able to do the trainings. We also, and I mentioned very early in our conversation, the National Disaster Medical System. So it's these teams of clinicians um, that can go out in disasters and help support whatever the health system is that's under siege. And uh, we did that. We, we deployed them quite a bit during COVID to decompress hospitals, uh, intensive care units that were overwhelmed. We brought in uh, these clinicians to set up and be able to provide additional beds, additional care, and support those health workers that were on the ground, that were exhausted, that needed a break, or needed to be able to work in a different part of the hospital to keep that system going. So we have a couple of tools that we're looking at, but we know one of the enduring um, things coming out of COVID is going to be an exhausted workforce. And we are looking for all manner of ways that we can help support teams, bring fresh, you know, fresh folks to the to the fight um, the best that we can. But th this is going to be something that I think the whole department and actually, you know, the whole country is going to face is how we keep our healthcare workers um, supported and moving forward. Well, as we come toward the end, I want to ask a couple of uh, forward-looking questions, and then I'll close with a question I ask everyone. But uh, before we do that, one of our listeners asked about the administration's priorities for PAPA reauthorization. Is that something you can talk about? Absolutely. So I've um, we've been thinking an awful lot about that. So I mentioned that that's our authorizing statute. That was the one that set us up in 2006. So we look at it very carefully and think about things um, you know, that we don't have, that we should have, or ways in which we should be imagined in this authorization bill. And of course, coming out of COVID, it's pretty 
trans it's pretty you know it, it, it easy for us to come up with with some things you know in in contrast to the way we looked 3 years ago um i've often said and continue to believe it'd be malpractice if we were the same organization coming out of these 3 years that we were going in and when i look at the things that worked and didn't work um there's some things that we had to do and i mentioned we had to rely on other departments and agencies to do some of the work that was needed uh very early on we had to rely on the department of defense for our acquisitions work when it became apparent that hhs did not have the authorities to move contracts as quickly as we needed to to get those early vaccine and therapy contracts under way, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with DOD, and DOD has executed $90 billion of uh, contracts on our behalf over the course of this response. That memorandum of understanding ends at the end of this fiscal year. Um, so what I'm looking to do, and one of the things I'm asking for in the PAPA bill, is the same authorities that DOD has. What is it that DOD could do that moved out so quickly? Why are they able to fund a prototype to a production a finished product without having to recompete like we do. What authority is that? You know, I don't have time and I won't to stop and recompete all of these if it's just up to me. And I don't know that I can count on DOD to help next time. You know, we were so lucky to have the whole of government, but this is a complex threat landscape that we work in. And I can't always count on DOD being available to run my contract. So I need that capability myself. So I'm asking for those authorities. And then when I look at, you know, the staffing, those things that you know, in order to surge the work that we were required to do, uh, we had to rely on FEMA and the U.S. Coast Guard to come in and to bring additional boots on the ground for us. Some of that's because we don't have direct hire authority to be able to bring people on as quickly as possible. So I'm seeking that as well. I looked at all the ways in which we didn't have what we needed throughout the course of this pandemic, and I'm trying to solve for that. So moving forward, HHS will be able to do the HHS responses um, in-house. And, you know, if we're lucky enough to have the support and partnership of other members of the administration, we will take it, but we can't always count on that. So I want to make sure we can stand on our own. So I was going to ask, what do you need to succeed? But it sounds to me like that and a budget, you've basically yeah. already answered the question. Is there anything you would add to what it's going to take for you to feel like uh, well, I think that's a success? I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I would say we are a success. I mean, everyone's had the fair, vaccines fair and therapeutics yes. because of the work that we've done and, you know, the investments we've made in the supply chain and the ability to decompress those hospitals in need. So we've been, you know, we have been very successful, but what I would like to do is solidify that success and build it, you know, as a, a winning formula moving forward. And so you're absolutely right. Those authorities, those things that we didn't have before that we had to rely on others, I'm trying to bring them in-house so I can do that moving forward myself. I'm also looking to make sure through your through the budget, you're exactly right, that I'm able to fund these capabilities that I've built, that we've needed, always needed, but we've never been able to put together because we didn't have the funding. I had funding for, you know, during COVID. I want to keep those things so I can use them against whatever's coming next. And something, unfortunately, will come next because it always does. So uh, th those are the things that I'm looking for, uh, just to strengthen our position, to make sure HHS has the response organization it needs. Well, I always ask my guests as we uh, wrap up to reflect a little bit on their own career. Uh, I am sure we have some people listening who are earlier in career and are thinking about uh, what they might want to do. And um, you can sort of take this wherever you want because it's really, you're talking about yourself, but um, I'm curious about whether they're critical decisions you made early along the way that got you here, if there are insights you picked up in uh, working on the Hill that are helpful uh, in this role. And I'll just say personally, um, I'm really struck by your focus on infrastructure and, and, and sustainability. Maybe that's the lawyer in you and the lawyer in me too. Um, but uh, that sense of institutional strength um, and not just the issues in front of you today Anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, what's uh, what you've learned along the way and decisions you've made along the way. Well, Alan, thank you for that question. And let me assure everybody I'm full of advice and I'll try to rein it in. But if anyone is looking for advice, of course, I'm always happy to talk about how, how I got here, some decisions that you know worked out but I did have a more unusual, uh, you know, I think approach to the work that I'm in. You know, whenever I testify, it's always doctor, 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 and then Dawn. Um, yeah, I am a lawyer, which people don't anticipate. So the first lawyer, non-doctor to occupy the role that I do. But I think the president put me in this role 
to manage and to be sure that there was a steady hand on the wheel in order to move the work forward. And then, Alan, as we've talked about, to build the strength and capability that we will need for future responses and, you know, to make sure that we're fully prepared. And those are things you don't have to be a doctor for. Um, you just have to, you know, love being where it's complex, love problem solving, uh, love those challenges. And that's what calls me to this work. Um, but I am an English major, and I have to say my staff sometimes um, might not appreciate that when I send the line edits back to make sure that everything is grammatically correct. I sort of, uh, you know, using words in a different way, but I think the way we talk about our work is so important. A lot of people don't know what ASPR is. They don't know what ASPR does. And I would like to change that. But in order to do that, we have to use words that people understand. Uh, we have to be clear in the way that we communicate. We have to be coherent in the story that we tell. So being being an English major has contributed to that, but I, I did, I, I was an English major and then I moved over to law school and in law school I saw um, and had the opportunity to study some of the laws and got really curious about why a period was there instead of a comma, all these very critical things when you're reading a bill. And so I, I then left, um, finished law school, took and passed the bar came up to Washington and began working on the Hill to try to understand why those periods were there instead of commas and to get a feel for things. And I think understanding how the Hill works has been really informative and instructive for me and the approach that I've done uh, and been able to take in the administration. I moved from the Hill over to uh, the Deputy Chief of Staff's role in the Obama administration's HHS and began doing crisis management there. It was around the Secretary's table that I got pulled in to the Ebola response and then the Zika response and unaccompanied children response. And in each of those, it was making sure that the department was as fast twitch as possible, moving out against some very challenging and complex issues. And that's the experience that I then took to, to CEPI as the director of the Washington office, um, which has really informed my ability to understand how vaccines can be uh, developed quickly against potential threats. And then, of course, here I am uh, and have been pleased. So despite starting as an English major, I got here and it does kind of make sense. But if, you know, go where it's interesting, go where you're challenged, go where you can be impactful. I've sort of followed those tenants and um, and couldn't be happier to be where I am uh, working with the team. It's just an honor of a lifetime. Well, I spent a lot of time around uh, doctors and PhDs, so I often get called Dr. Weil, even though I also just have a lowly JD like you. So uh, Don <laughs> from Allen, I can say, uh, it's really been a pleasure talking to you. I um, really am, uh, have enjoyed what you've had to say. Um, thank you for what you're doing to help us all be safer and preparing for the unknown. Uh, it's it's uh, in many times thankless, like much of public health. You, you don't know it's there until you need it, um, but boy, do we need it when we do. And so I'm grateful for what you're doing and uh, thankful to you for explaining the complex uh, roles that Asper has to play. So um, thank you for uh, being with me today on our Policy Spotlight. Um, thank you so much for having me. This has been a real treat. Again, an opportunity to talk about the work that we do just makes me happy, so thank you. That's great. As we wrap up, I'll just let the audience know that uh, on Tuesday, May 23rd, we're having a lunch and learn focused on what we've learned from our health equity project over the last three years. Uh, that event will be hosted by uh, UC Davis professor Michelle Coe, who's a member of our equity advisory committee, and it will feature Tulane University assistant professor Andrew Anderson, who's a recent uh, graduate of our health equity fellowship for trainees program. That event is open to the public, but we do hope you'll also consider becoming a Health Affairs Insider, which offers additional exclusive access to content beyond the journal. You can sign up for that at our website. We'll continue to have events like this and others uh, over the summer, and we uh, encourage you to keep an eye out for them. And with that, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to the audience for the questions. Thank you, Ms. O'Connell, for being with me today, and we are adjourned.